NGO organizations are not that many in Malaysia. We are talking about Malaysia. But we have 30 million of citizens in Malaysia. And now, out of these 30 million of citizens in Malaysia, I think even 50%, even 50% 50 even 50 of us able to change our consciousness, I think we can do a lot in changing the climate change. So the question is how to change our consciousness. And uh, for us, I think very important, Brahma Kumaris, we always believe that the change in consciousness is the most important. See, sometimes we look at others as friends, my colleagues, my siblings, but why not we change our consciousness, look at the nature, look at the climate as our brother or friend. And we know that as a brother and friend, we don't give any sorrow to the brother and friend. We don't misuse them. We don't mistreat them. That is one of the ways to change the consciousness and looking at the nature and the climate around us. So not to waste too much time, I think on behalf of uh, Brahma Kumaris Foundation, uh, we thank all of you for making your precious time this evening to enjoy this very challenging uh, forum this evening. And we really hope you can participate because at the end, I saw the program at the end, there's a question and answer that all of you are welcome. All of you are welcome very much to uh, pose to the speakers. Okay, with that, once again, I would like to thank all of you for making your time this evening. Thank you very much. Brother Pio, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to introduce a very special person today. She is one of the most diligent advocates in Malaysia to fight climate change, trying her best to promote a greener environment. She welcomes all individuals who are in this fight together whom she describes with her own words, they take every breath as an amana. Trust, a trust to us to protect, preserve, and value this beautiful land. She is the chairman of Climate Governance Malaysia. She's an adjunct professor of climate governance at UNITAR International University, chairman of Dutch Lady Milk Industries, board member of several companies and a trustee of six charitable foundation. The list goes on and on. Despite that busy schedule that she has, she has kindly allowed some time to be with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great honor for us to invite our special guest, Datin Sri Sunita Rajkumar, to present her opening address. That in three, please. Because it's 
So sorry, just a few minutes because I have my slides here, but apparently it's not connected to the projector. So um, in this age of high tech, I have to. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to assume that most of you understand the science behind the crisis that we are facing. And I will try and give some updates of what I understand the latest science to be. But essentially, what we're facing is uh, what I would describe, and many would describe, as an existential crisis. I think it's wonderful that the Brahma Kumaris are looking so closely into this, and uh, the organizers have assured that this is going to be a series, because we all need to play a role in increasing our adaptation, our climate resilience, right? As in how, how, how as a country, we're going to be able to cope with what is already going to be happening. So I think it's very clear that Earth cannot sustain both population growth and economic growth. We're simply uh, consuming much, much more than Earth can replenish naturally. And the rate of warming is also accelerating as well. Next, please. So, So what we're seeing very clearly is as a result of human activity or what they call anthropogenic activity, the world has been getting warmer. And I, I, don't, I think it's very difficult to argue against this, although there are some people who think otherwise. Next, please. So we can see, especially in the last month in June, that temperature records were broken in many parts of the world. The highest, and this is just the beginning because we now have started El Nino, uh, and so increased uh, temperatures are going to be the norm. And if just as we've had three years of La Nina, we face three years of El Nino, I think it's going to be a very, very different world. We're on track to hit 1.5 degrees of warming in the next few years. So this is not something in 2030 or 2050. I think we've used up the remaining carbon budget, especially with the Canadian forest fires. Uh, and so it's going to be extremely difficult to as the topic seems to suggest, reverse climate change, I, I don't think that's going to be possible. Even if we hit net zero tomorrow, which will be almost uh, impossible, um, the warming that's accumulated uh, in the oceans, in the atmosphere, is going to carry on. We, we cannot, it's not binary. We can't just turn it off. So I think that's something very important to remember. And of course, later on, I'll describe the slow moving ecological systems that have also started to slow down as well as a result of our activity. Next, please. So the rate of global warming is also accelerating. This is creating an unprecedented imbalance in the amount of energy coming in. We're quite possibly living in a climate that no human has lived through before. And we are living in a climate that no human has lived in since before the birth of agriculture. So human civilization has thrived for a few millennia now because we live within a very narrow climatic envelope. So you might have some extreme weather events, but by and large, weather has been predictable. The climate has been predictable. But that's not going to be the case anymore, and we don't even understand what this means for us. Next, please. So some estimates are that rising sea levels plus normal flood height for Klang Valley, for example, will come all the way past Kota Kamoning and to the borders of Subang Jaya. These are some of the estimates that we are looking at. Next, please. And so these are scenes which have just recently happened. We are like the proverbial frog in a boiling pot. You know, when you see this and there's so much content that we need to consume every day, sometimes you might not recognize, but this is what is already happening to us. Next, please. And not only is, are we looking at, uh, because warmer air holds more moisture, so you get f uh, torrential rains or rain bombs, and this leads to flash flooding. And once you have earth that is uh, soaked with water, then you have soil movement as well. So you've got landslides, sinkholes. Next, please. So you're going to have more and more scenes like this. And as we all know, it takes a very long time to rehabilitate for remediation works. 
you only need to look at Kelantan to understand how it, uh, flash flooding can happen very quickly and it can take years to recover from the damage to property and of course there will be loss of lives as well. Next please. So a lot of businesses, because I engage with the private sector, mistake this as a reporting and disclosure problem that they think that if they report and if they say how they're going to reach net zero by 2050, then they resolve the problem. That's only the tip of the iceberg. The reason why there's so much momentum for reporting and disclosure is so that allocators of capital, like banks and investors, can assess for themselves if you are likely to make a smooth transition, whether you're a business or an industry or a country or a region, or if you don't look as though you'll be able to make a smooth transition and they will divert capital away from you. So a lot of businesses mistake this as a reporting and disclosure problem. But as you can see, if your staff can't come to work, if they can't get access to healthcare, if emergency first responders are not able to come out, if you don't have food security, then it doesn't really matter what you're reporting, right? Next, please. Unfortunately, the adaptation measures that we're thinking of just isn't enough. We might spend a lot of money on buns, sand buns, for example, only for it to be washed away within the next few months. We don't need to look overseas for solutions. I believe that there are many veterans here in Malaysia, and we've got some sitting in the audience right now, who have spent decades of their lives working as sustainability practitioners, we need to be humble enough to crowdsource for local, hyper-localized solutions which are high impact, which will increase our climate resilience. And that is the responsibility of every single one of us in this room. It is not someone else's responsibility. You have this responsibility to look after your neighbors, your community. Next, please. So these are some of the scenes, and can you please press again next? These are some of the scenes that you'll be seeing, that you, we have already seen, and that we will be seeing more commonly, which um, are very difficult to anticipate. This is a crisis that is described as being foreseeable and yet unpredictable. This is how difficult it is for us to estimate what actually are we facing up with, and especially when it comes to soil movement. Next, please. So you can have areas of soil which are fully vegetated, fully covered with foliage, and yet because it's sodden with water, and maybe the soil composition includes minerals like mica, silica, so that little bit of movement is enough to cause this massive landslide, for example, with hardly any warning. So as you can imagine, it is very difficult to protect ourselves from instances like this. And this is only going to be increasing in frequency and severity. Next, please. So these videos, and press next again. These videos are something which happen in Jaipur. So when you have flash flooding, we are almost 80% urbanized, we're 78% urbanized. So in an urban environment, it's very difficult for water to walk, wash through, right? And you don't have soil which can absorb water as well. So you will have these sort of scenes which are very difficult for us to defend ourselves against and then to recover from at the end of the day. So here we are talking about one of the planetary boundaries which we've already most probably crossed, which is climate change caused by greenhouse gas emissions. But we have a pollution problem as well, the amount of plastics in the world that we are not able to manage. Next, please. With the changes in our weather system, we're also unable to predict or anticipate changing weather patterns. So for example, you could have trees which are 100 years old, which can be felled in a storm because the wind came from a different direction. Next, please. So this means that, next please. So this means that we're not able to anticipate the extent of the change that we're going to be facing, if even the winds can come from a different direction. Next, please. So as with a classic market failure, if there's a problem, and here the problem is that the polluter, the business which is emitting greenhouse gas, is profiteering. 
and the rest of society is bearing the cost of this pollution. So this is a market failure. And how do you address this? By pricing this negative externality. Unfortunately, the price that we're looking at is beyond what many households, individuals, businesses, and industries are willing to pay. So here the estimate is, for example, $160 per tonne. Next, please. So last year, because of the Ukraine war, we had unprecedented bumper profits by oil and gas companies. So Saudi Aramco, $161 billion in profits, but these profits would be wiped out at a carbon price of $100 per tonne. Next, please. And if you look at the top oil companies as well, fossil fuel companies, almost all of their profits would be wiped out or they'd go into loss-making territory at only $100 per ton. So the reason why they're making profits and massive amounts of profits, it's because they're not paying for the polluting effects that they are having. But it is very difficult, understandably, for countries to impose this because who pays this? If Petronas is going to pay $100 per ton, we are going to be affected, right? So this is a big challenge that we are facing right now. And just to remind us next, please, that $100 per ton is the price at which emissions are already trading at in, and this is Europe, 121 US dollars. Next, please. And in the UK, 107 US dollars. Next, please. So we're only touching on one of the planetary boundaries. Press next, which is climate change, rate of biodiversity loss, ocean acidification, global freshwater use. These are the ones that we commonly understand. Next, please. But there's other boundaries that we also most probably have crossed uh, in this country, especially uh, our rate of deforestation. Can we agree on zero deforestation, for example? How much is that actually going to cost us especially as land is a state matter and states need a source of income. Next, please. And then finally, we have boundaries like ozone depletion, atmospheric aerosol loading, chemical pollution that we don't fully understand and that we can't fully measure as well. We know that microplastics have been found in the highest mountain and in the Mariana Trench. So we know that it is in our respiratory system and we're breathing it in. We know that microplastics are in the food chain, so it is in our digestive system. We know that microplastics are in our blood because it has been found in fetus blood. So we're congesting all of this and we don't fully understand the effects that it has on our body. So next please. So we are, contravene we are going surpassing planetary boundaries on a rate that has never been seen, seen before. Um, next, please. And we don't fully understand what the impacts or implications are. Thank you. Another way of describing it is the slow moving ecological systems. So the melting of ice at the poles, the Amazon rainforest, the Atlantic meridional ocean current, which is well, virtually slowing down right now, coral, coral reefs, large scale dying off. So all of this keeps us alive. You know, when we described uh, that every breath is an amana, really half your lungs are outside your body, and we have destroyed this, it's going to be extremely difficult to get this to a level where it is thriving again. So we really need to talk about how we're going to adapt to this warmer world, to this new world that we have created. And it is not the children's problem or our grandchildren's problem. So this in The Lancet, which was published a few years ago, is a direct correlation between what the ecological drivers are and what our health effects are. How is this going to affect our health? So for example, these impacts on planetary health are going to have impacts on personal health. I've described some to you, but the doctors, the physicians, researchers are already looking into this. How is this going to affect us individually? And one of the things that they are saying is that allergic conditions, which they are seeing on an increasing rate, are a sentinel measure of environmental impact on human health in early life. So that is going to be one of the first few indicators that the human body 
is not able to cope with our polluting, our collective polluting activities. So this is a much bigger problem than just carbon emissions. It's a much bigger problem than just flash flooding and extreme heat days. So what we're facing are what some people describe as climate endgame scenarios. And we know least about these scenarios that are going to matter the most. So in November last year, at the Proceedings for the National Academy of Sciences, Dr. Luke Kim presented a paper that we need to do more research on what he calls climate endgame scenarios. So in this part of the world, what are the scenarios that we're looking at if we have geopolitical tension, mass migration, dispute over freshwater resources, food security challenges, on top of extreme heat days, flash flooding and soil movement. So we don't fully understand this. I'm sorry to leave it on such a bleak note, but there's so much that we can do as individuals as well. At a minimum, we need to be so much more energy efficient. I know it's so easy to get distracted by talks of renewable energy, but can we reduce our energy consumption to as little as possible? Be much more mindful about how much power you're using. I understand power, energy is the ultimate lifestyle product. It enables us to do so many things, and it is important in our lives, but we're using it very wastefully. Number two, can we be zero waste households and offices? Zero waste. So not just having bins, but we have no waste. So all your organic waste, as little as possible, is composted, and all your inorganic waste needs to be cleaned, separated, and sent for use somewhere else. Can we all be responsible for vertical farming or growing our own vegetables? Because we have no food security. We might have eggs and poultry for two to three months, but our feed is imported. And even if we have eggs, if we have a neighboring country that's willing to pay more for our eggs, then we don't have eggs. So we need to learn how to become much more self-reliant. So this is what is coming up. I'm not sugarcoating this. This is what is going to happen. And everybody in this room has a tremendous role and responsibility to play. It is so, not something that you can delegate to the prime minister or the minister or someone else during your coffee, talk, talk, coffee shop talk. It is our responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. My test. Thank you, Datin Sri. So we know least about the scenarios that matter the most. And I agree. I think many of us agree too. Um, so that is why we are here, gathered to know more because this really matters, especially when it comes to our personal health and our family's personal health. So thank you once again, Datin Sri. We move on now to the highlight of the event today, the forum. So to moderate the discussion today, we have the head of international and corporate services of the Brahma Kumaris Foundation, an official secretary for Council of National Coordinators of Brahma Kumaris World Spiritual Organization at Mount Abu, Rajasthan an experienced and inspiring speaker who is so passionate also, she's very passionate about the climate change, who believes very strongly that this is not a one-man battle. She believes all of us has to be, have to be on board. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sister Celia, Celia Wong, our moderator for today. Now, the panelists for today, we've got two heavyweights with us today. So, uh, the, so the first one, trained as an ag agronomist, soil hydrologist, and ecological modeler. So some of us are wondering, like, like, very technical, right? So he is a very, very technically involved his career. And uh, he's also, so he practiced the environmental policy making, greenhouse gas accounting, and climate diplomacy for the Malaysian government. Now he's retired. So is he relaxed now? No, he's busier. He works to bring together technical innovators, policy makers, I think that's the most challenging part, no? policy makers, regulators, advocates, and other key stakeholders in the climate change. 
And uh, he believes that transitioning to, to a secular economy will facilitate emission reduction and enhance adaptation capacity to pave the way to zero emission. And he is really very passionate because while waiting there, I just went in to ask one question and he gave like one to one lecture about about certain topics. I was like, wow, like very, very passionate. So please welcome Dr. Gary Tessera, ladies and gentlemen. The other esteemed panelist for today is a spiritual leader and environmental activist. She is Brahma Kumari's permanent representative to United Nations Environment Programs and regional representative to Economic and Social Commission for Africa, while also serving as the Assistant Regional Director of Brahma Kumari's Africa region. Please put your hands together to welcome BK Pratiba Patel to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the forum, there will be a question and answer session. So do take note of any questions you may have so that they can be answered at the end of this forum. So I now hand over the time to Ms. Celia. Hello? Okay, good. So very good evening and greetings of peace to everyone here tonight. And thank you very much, Sister Amuda, for that very sweet and kind introduction. So dear distinguished guests, fellow participants, respected keynote speaker, Datin Sri Sunita Rajkumar, Respected esteemed panelists, Dr. Gary Tassera and Didi Pratiba Patel, I am indeed most delighted to welcome all of you to this very special, very crucial for open forum panel discussion on the topic of paramount importance. How to reverse climate change? Do we know the missing dimension? So as we are gathered here tonight, we have a shared commitment. I say shared commitment because we can't depend on the government, the policies, the technocrats, the scientists, to clean up, to do all that for us. Each of us have a commitment to addressing one of the pressing, most pressing challenges of our time, the existential threat the climate change imposes on each and every one of us. So as we have heard, and now I also understand a lot better <laughs> from Datin Sri's presentation. So over the years, I'm sure all of us must have witnessed the devastating impact of rising temperatures, of extreme weather events, of biodiversity loss, biodiversity loss and the degradation of ecosystem. These effects are not confined, as you can see, to one single region or community. It reverberates across borders, affecting all of us. So hence, this open forum discussion is so crucial, is so vital, and definitely very timely. So during our discussion tonight, we encourage participants to engage actively with our esteemed panelists, to share, to ask thought-provoking questions, 
to share your valuable insights so that together we can enrich, we can bring about a more insightful and enlightening conversation. And so, and also find, I would say, inspire us to find more actionable solutions. So without further ado, I would like to now start the discussion. And um, I was thinking of asking Dr. Gary about some of the most significant impacts, but I have seen a lot already from Dr. Sunita's, Tatin Sri Sunita's presentation. So I'm going to skip that uh, if it's okay with you. But in the midst of that, afterwards, if there's still something that you find the most significant, we can come back to that. And so I'll just straight away jump onto what is um, our experts have with us. We know that Dr. Gary Tessera is an um, environmental scientist. He has been with the government for a long time. And so my question to you to open up this discussion is that, you know, governments and organizations have implemented various policies and initiatives to combat climate change. So Dr. Gary, could you highlight some successful climate change policies that have made a tangible difference? Some climate change policies that have made some tangible difference and what were the key factors that led to the success, contributed to the successes? Thank you very much, uh, Sister Celia. And, and before I begin, allow me to say uh, how humbling and, and what an honor it is to, to be invited to uh, have this interaction with you this evening. I, I really deeply appreciate the invitation and relish the, the, question, uh, the opportunity to share uh, my experiences with you. Um, policy, of course, occurs at, at many levels, uh, beginning at the highest levels at multilateral uh, negotiations, multilateral policies that have come down. So we've had the uh, Kyoto Protocol, we have uh, the convention uh, under which the Kyoto Protocol sits. Of course, the pr protocol has been now superseded and replaced by the Paris Agreement. All of you know that under the Paris Agreement, which is bottom up compared to the protocol, which was top down, all countries have both voluntary and obligatory uh, uh, responsibilities, right? Voluntary in the sense that no one tells a country where to set its emissions reductions target. The country sets their emissions reductions target. Obligatory in the sense that you have to set a target. You also are legally obligated under the Paris Agreement to report on your progress towards achieving the target, but you're not legally obligated to actually achieve the target. And this unfortunately was the very low threshold uh, that was possible through a multilateral process that can only be done by consensus. There was no voting involved. Uh, everyone had to be seen to be pulling in the same direction. And so when you rely on consensus, that's what you get. Now, in terms of, of government policy, now as to the question as whether it's been successful or not, uh, I, I would have to say that, that uh, because of the nature of international multilateral negotiations, it has been difficult to realize real progress on this. Uh, all countries tend to fall back on their quote unquote sovereign rights. Yeah? Uh, they may have uh, populations that they need to feed, they may uh, have re they may lack resources, they may need to sell resources. Uh, there are some countries that may be forest poor, they may be arable land poor. Right? You know, how can you feed a country if all you have is desert? But if your desert has oil, all of a sudden you can feed your country. Who has a right to tell you you should reduce your population so that you can survive on the land that you can farm, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So countries are pulled obviously in many directions, and this has led, unfortunately, to a fairly weak international response. Uh, which in some ways has been gamed by the countries that have more political clout. 
In fact, uh, there have been at least two attempts to move the convention out from under the UN as a body and put it under the UN Security Council, a body which has far fewer countries as members who make the decisions, and some countries even have veto power in the Security Council. Fortunately for us, those efforts have failed and it remains uh, something that the UN does. Now, we get down from, from uh, you know, perhaps multilateral policy down to some uh, perhaps regional areas or maybe down even to local. There are some uh, uh, also policy decisions that actually come out of international bodies, but have some uh, more bearing on the private sector. All right, so we have uh, groups like the UN Global Compact who have uh, come up with recommendations for businesses. In some ways, I think these initiatives have been a little bit more successful because you know agencies like the, the World Trade Organization uh, and, and governing, uh, governing bodies, for example, like the International Labour Organization, ILO, right? also take into account things like having a just transition. If we, are, if we are expected to move away from fossil fuels, what are the jobs that people who are involved in the prospecting of fossil fuels, the mining, the drilling of fossil fuels, refining of fossil fuels, transportation, sales of fossil fuels, what can they do? They have to be reskilled, they have to be retrained, and many times they can be moved into areas that involve renewable energy or, or green industries that might help. So um, when it comes down to the local level and national policies, um, obviously we have had some success with uh, some of our oldest policies, as a matter of fact. Uh, the pledge to keep half of our country uh, under forest cover is something that we actually should be very proud of because it has withstood pretty much the test of time. Right? Any, uh, if you say you're going to do something uh, and, and you, you stick with it, that should be something that, that you should be recognized for. Uh, has there been leakage? Yes. Has there been timber theft? Yes. Have there been degazettements, regazettements, replacements, etc.? Yes. But if you look at, at history now, the most recent recommendations for degazettement, the good news is that through local pressure, through local awareness, and even supported in some cases, uh, by the, the royal families, the royal houses, we have actually managed to reverse some of those. So the new generation of royals, once again, uh, is stepping up. Younger people are stepping up. Uh, and, and so these are some of the areas where, where we would, would um, see change. Now, finally, the, another area that I see change actually is uh, the level of response or re level of, uh, um, I would say, um, uh, it's, it's, more, it's more something like uh, the uh, willingness of uh, elected officials and government officials to uh, take into account views expressed by different stakeholder groups. Uh, we've had a number of uh, uh, relatively short-lived administrations in the recent history. Even the present administration is fairly young, but one of the things that struck me just two months ago in the month of May, uh, we had some very strong policy announcements, for example, regarding the, the lifting of the ban on the export of renewable energy, regarding the uh, permission or, or the ability to sell generated electricity, renewable electricity from peer to peer, the ability to or, or the, the uh, agreement to put uh, solar PV on all government buildings by the end of this year, and even more recently, uh, the bill on energy efficiency and energy conservation. So all of these things, even though there are no details, they send a very important directional message where the country should be going. They're not, they're no time frames yet. There may not be uh, milestones yet, but this already sends a very strong signal the direction uh, in which Malaysia intends to proceed. And I think that's some of the best news that we have so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek. Yeah, uh, that is very heartening <laughs> to hear that so many policies are in, in the pipeline for reversing or helping or reducing in this climate change. 
And now I'd like to um, direct my next question to Didi Pratiba uh, from the Brahma Kumaris. And as you know, the Brahma Kumaris are very much involved in this aspect of climate change. And Didi Pratiba is a permanent main representative of the Brahma Kumaris to the United Nations Environmental Program. And so I would like to direct my question related to that. So especially relating to spirituality and tackling climate change. So how does the Brahma Kumaris organization see the connection between spirituality and environment? How can spiritual response or spiritual principles contribute to reversing climate change? Thank you. But first of all, maybe some of you may not really fully understand the word spirituality because some connotate it to religion, which is really not. So maybe you can just touch a little bit on that first to share with us spirituality, more what? to values and so on. Yeah, thank you. Greetings of peace and Om Shanti, which simply means I am a peaceful being. It's not a mantra, it's not a chanting, but it's a state of mind. When I first stepped into the UN, that was I think 45 years ago, they looked at me and was wondering, what is this lady doing here? Because it was, spirituality was Latin to them, especially faith, religion and spirituality. But we carried on and on and on. And what did we do there? We didn't run workshops and, you know, seminars. And I was speaking to Akim Stainer one day. I said, Akim, you know what? I don't understand this language. And he says, don't worry. I also don't understand. <laughs> but with the day, it, with time, Sister Pratibha, you'll start understanding. It's such a technical language. I'm sorry. It's only very few people can understand that language. And so for a lay person, it's so simple. A lot of people tell me, you people do so many meetings and Unia 1 and Unia 2, and you're wasting time and money. And they said, does it work? Like how Celia just asked my brother here, what is the policy you made? Did you achieve it? You know, it doesn't just come in a day. Anything. But at least if we positively sow the seed, someday the fruit will definitely come. And so what we're doing is we're not wasting time. And we're not wasting money. But what we are doing is sowing the seed in every individual. And one day we will definitely achieve. Like as a child, I remember when we used to check in, I used to travel a lot as a child. And my parents used to take us and we had smoking and non-smoking, right? But if you even sit in the non-smoking area, the smoke is going to disturb you anyway. So what's the use of that? A time came, look now, all airports, all airlines, all washrooms are smoke free. So that seed was sown 50, 60 years ago. Then the outcome came. So similarly, we can't say that climate change is just a gimmick. I used to travel, I've been based in Nairobi for 45 years. And I travel every time I take a flight, which I don't like, of course, if I can avoid, I wouldn't. I'll take a train, I'll take a road. But anyway, 
I just passed by the Kilimanjaro. I used to live in that city. Every day in the morning, first thing, I'll go out and meditate with it. It was magnificent, beautiful. Global warming? All the cap of the Kilimanjaro is melted. You can't see it. The beauty is gone. So it is completely naked. Shame, I would say. And so in India, spiritually, there is a word called Purush and Prakruti. I know it's Latin to you. It was Latin to me too, but I understood. Purush means human beings, irrespective where we come from. What faith, color, age, size, it doesn't matter. But we are human beings. And Prakruti means environment. Purushin Prakruti goes hand in hand. And what have we done? We've separated two. Purush is in its own world, and Prakruti, the environment, is in their own world. So it's exactly like a body without a spirit. A body without a spirit becomes corpse. And a spirit without a body is a ghost. How does it work? And this is what we have done with our environment. When I get another chance, I want to tell you about UNEP and the faith for Earth later. Thank you so much. I think that is something very interesting for the audience to know. Separation of the spirit and the body, and that is what has led to what's happening in the environment. Something interesting for us to think about. And so I'd like to come back to Dr. Gary and also relating to something Latin Sri Sunita said about the profit businesses make, which as a result cause environmental problems as well. So with respect to this, I like to ask Dr. Gary, as we aim to reverse climate change, what role do you see businesses playing in this endeavor? It's not easy, but what role can we attempt to fix onto the business people to have more responsibility? Are there any successful? I'm, I'm looking for more success stories today because the picture that we saw earlier was so gloomy, isn't it? So dark, as if the world is coming to an end, but I believe it's not. We have definitely missed the missing dimension. So uh, what success examples would you like to share with us and, um, regarding sustainable practices and so on? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sister Celia. And, and uh, before I go any further, uh, I'd also like, like to, to uh, note the fact that, that uh, uh, even, even our MC uh, made some, some very, very important observations, uh, one of which was, was uh, something about uh, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel uh, with respect to how we, we uh, human beings uh, address this issue. Uh, the earth is remarkably resilient. It was here for 1.8 million years with ice age cycles, uh, and we only came as a species 300,000 years ago. Uh, and, and even then, up to about 50,000 years ago, we were still sharing the planet with other hominids, Neanderthals, um, Denisovians, and others. So we, we, we've come after a long period of, of, of uh, uh, stability, and we are a product of that stability. It would be very ironic if we were to destroy that stability, the very stability that gave rise to our species in, in the first place. So to me, uh, it's not so much whether there'll be light at the end of the tunnel, the sun will still come up, so it will be morning everywhere all the time. Big question is, will humans be there to see it? 
I have to believe that humans will, otherwise, you know, I'm wasting my time here as well, right? The, the, the more relevant question is, is when humans see it, in what state will they be? All right, because um, the other question is, uh, uh, when we talk about floods, when we talk about droughts, when we talk about landslides, loss of life, etc., uh, I always say that, that climate change is something that impacts humans just beyond the horizon of our vision. What we see is a price rise in poultry, perhaps. But what leads to that price rise, price hike in poultry is actually a drought somewhere in Brazil, in Argentina, where they grow soybeans for soybean meal, where they grow corn for corn meal. It's families that may have to go without meals because of that. What we may see is uh, an increase in, in uh, the price of watermelon, right? But what's actually happening to the people who produce that watermelon? What we see is a sound bite on television or a vision, an audio from a, a video from a TikTok, which has a limit of time. But that implies hundreds, thousands of people in misery, suffering, who are worried about tomorrow, who may not have food, who have to look at their children and who have to listen to their children say, I'm hungry. So, that, so climate change actually is, is beyond the sight of most of us. It really is what we don't see. But the thing is, the thing about corporations is that corporations are made out of people. It doesn't matter whether you're on the board of directors or you're on the floor. It doesn't matter if you're in the supply chain, right? The question that we continue to ask is, what can we do where we are? Right? And so as a collective, the business world needs to respond to climate change. And thankfully, through international organizations that are requiring businesses to understand the impact that they're having on the environment, the impact that they're having on society, the need for governance within their organizations, they are being called to measure and to report. They're being called to disclose. For example, corporations now need to know if they are hiring foreigners, if these workers of theirs have had to pay agency fees in their home countries. And some corporations are actually, have actually reimbursed their workers. There's no legal obligation to, no legal obligation to it. But because they believe that this is something that will affect at least their brand reputation, they're doing it. Right? So this one example, this is just one example of many other areas, including uh, extended producer responsibility. We talk about being zero waste. But as a community, you know, how, how are we doing in, in that area? At least I know in, in my neighborhood, we actually have a neighborhood recycling program that's going on. So, so that in the end, what, what goes out to my compost and, and what goes out to recycling is much, much more than what goes actually into the, the, the waste bin that, that the city council picks up, the concession picks up, right? But I really think that, that uh, in many cases, uh, businesses are actually doing more than, than governments because their sustainability relies on the uh, uh, reputation of their brand and the way they relate with their workers and all the other stakeholders in society, their supply chain, even their customers. Uh, information moves very, very fast in the private sector. You use a product, you don't like it, it gets on social media, immediately your brand is impacted. And so 
I think that as, as a collective, the business community not only uh, is responding more, but uh, actually in, in, in some ways has to respond more. And so uh, I really think that, that uh, if you look around you uh, and you yourselves begin to understand what businesses are doing and then begin to understand how you interact with them. Every time you walk into a grocery store, you're faced with a choice. Lots and lots of choices, lots and lots of brands. Think at least from a, a self-consciousness standpoint, just give us a, a split second of thought to how much packaging is involved, how much transportation is involved, how much fertilizer is involved, how much water is involved to all the products that you consume, right? Because that's what corporates are doing now, right? And, and this will, will begin to show you a direction that you can begin pulling in, in a common direction, I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gary. Um, I've got something um, to ask you to go further, but I wait for that first. I'll come to Sister Pratiba first. Didi Pratiba. Um, the theme that we are looking at, Didi Pratiba, is the missing dimension. And something I think all the policies and all the efforts may have missed or something that we have overlooked. So in addressing the missing dimension from the Brahma Kumaris or from your perspective, what is that missing dimension in our current efforts? We have heard Dr. Gary mention number of efforts the government policies and also the businesses are implementing are doing. But to us, what is that missing, the crucial missing dimension that would definitely help to reverse? Because just now, Tatin Sri Sunja said that it is like almost impossible. Um, even for example, zero carbon emission to find a balance. I think it is almost like quite difficult. So how can this aspect be integrated into the global initiatives that are currently in place effectively. I'd also agree with Sunita that 100% we can never expect because we are living in a world where science has taken over us. And so I, being a spiritual person, I fly a lot. And I can't stop because I'm trying to do the best. But from one end to the other, if my time is just going to go on road travels and walking, then the purpose of my aim wouldn't be served. Um, I would say, if we do not see this only on science level, or economical level, or political level, and let us go back to our original identity of spirituality. Not because that I'm a spiritual person, that's why I'm saying that, but it's a fact. And I was just mentioning that UNEP started another little agency under UNEP called Faith for Earth. Because every faith has something to contribute towards climate change and maybe not reversible, but at least can we save where we are? What has been damaged, we can't bring it back. But what is going to be damaging, can we save that much? And so I need to connect to that inner spirituality. In most of the aspect where we see, it's not only technical that the climate change has taken place but it's also um, you know spiritual we've become selfish we've become greedy we are you know how can i say i work at unep so every time i come home 
in our center. I want to separate all this. Huh? The vegetables and the skins should be going one place, the other thing here, there. And um, I, we all work towards that. We even have our own compost and everything. But the moment it goes into the garbage, the garbage collector mix everything and take it away. Why? Because one, the government doesn't even have, my brother here talked about municipal, we don't even have garbage collection system in the country. Earlier they were heaping and heaping, throwing into a corner or maybe go and throw it away uh, four or five houses away, you know? And the ladies would tell, don't throw near, near our house, go and throw it far, you know? The illness from there is going to spare you. It's not going to spare anyone. So this is selfishness. And so we go back to the original qualities and values of human. I remember uh, last March, June, June, July, I might be wrong with month, I was in Ivory Coast in Abidjan and we had the conference on desertification. And uh, I was there in the plenary with Satguru. <laughs> Satguru, I think some of you know him on the YouTube, he's very popular. And someone asked him, Satguru, before you were campaigning for water and sea and rivers, now you've changed, you're campaigning for soil. He says, I will campaign for what this Mother Earth needs. I'm not going to do anything else. And so he shared a very beautiful story which touched my heart. And he said, a few human beings went to God, whoever the God is, it doesn't matter. And uh, especially in human beings, they were scientists. And they said, God, you've worked very hard all your life. Now you retire. We're gonna take over the world now. And so God looked at them and said, all right, tell me one thing that I should retire. So they took soil, shaped it in a little baby shape, and they made it alive. In other words, cloning and all these things. And so God said, oh, okay. So you are equal to God because God is the only creator. So I should retire. They said, yes, that's why we're telling you to retire. Now we'll take over the world. God said, you used my soil. Go and make your own soil. <laughs> Did you see that? We have all the five elements later on I'll mention. Earth, water, sky, you know, whatever, fire, sun. Is it ours, man-made? Did science make it? Did I make it? Did you make it? No. It's natural calamities, it's environment, it's uh, elements which were given to us to use with respect. We disrespected, we abused, and look where we are today. And so what is our responsibility as a being or a spiritual being? Let us save. Let us save where we have destroyed till and go ahead. What are my contributions towards saving? We'll talk. Celia, yeah. is it okay? Thank you. Good. And we have just 15 minutes more and have got so much to ask. So anyway, I will make it quick and cover all aspects. There yeah, we covered the government policies and the business, the corporations. There's one group of people who are very dynamic and I think we should utilize whatever resources from them. And I'm referring to the, it's so crucial to involve the younger generation in this, isn't it? So the younger generation in climate change, have we really um, used those energy, the resources? So how can we, how can education, how can awareness, building initiatives, 
empower the youths in becoming active partners, active participants in reversing climate change? Thank you very much again for that question. Uh, this is an area where I've never shied away from, from talking about um, uh, and any opportunity to interact with young people uh, at, at any level. I think uh, all of us should avail ourselves of that. Um, I'm guilty myself. I have, to, I have to admit that when my son comes to me with questions, most of the time I have to ask him first, have you finished what you are supposed to finish before asking me these questions? Right, so I'm guilty of that too, so I'm putting my hand up first. But I think that, that um, children uh, and youth do what we do. They don't do what we tell them to do. Uh, so one of the, the strongest messages that you can send the younger generation is, is actually to put your money where your mouth is, as it were, and uh, begin making changes. Uh, it's it's not easy. Uh, uh, in going green, some of the hardest people to convince are your own family, literally. But what, what you will find is, uh, as was pointed out earlier, in the same way that now you couldn't even imagine a smoking flight, right? In the future, you probably would not be able to imagine a world where fossil fuels are the largest source of energy, right? So the young people nowadays are, are being encouraged to think about the world differently, and we can be part of that. We can help them to think about the world differently. Uh, once again, we are not saving the world, we are saving our civilization, right? The sun will still come up, the question is, will we be there to see it, and if we are, in what condition will we be? So the idea really is that, that we have information, we have tools, we have technologies, uh, and, and the young, in fact, now uh, have far more tools than we ever had uh, in doing something as simple as choosing their leadership. Many youth now are beginning to take policymakers to task are beginning to take decision makers to task. They are asking questions like, have you thought about the implications of this particular policy or that particular policy? They're beginning to look at elections. They're beginning to, to send questionnaires to the candidates to find out what the candidates' stances are on key environmental issues, policy issues, on things like uh, uh, the kinds of future work, green industries, etc. What kinds of investments do these potential uh, leaders, would, would they consider? Do you want to keep the country as a provider of cheap energy because it comes from fossil fuel, cheap labor because it comes from an unskilled workforce? Or do you want to actually move and become a country where people want to invest in it because the energy has a low carbon footprint, because the labor is skilled, because the quality of life is uh, better, because the uh, labor and the workforce are treated better, because they have, they have better benefits, and you've met some of the, the, the social obligations. All right, so um, I have hope for, for the young generation uh, because their eyes are more open than you think they are. They see more than you think they see, they hear more than you think they hear, and they know the kind of world that they want to grow up in. They know the kind of world that they want to raise their families in. And, and many times, some of us look back nostalgically at the kind of world we had when we were growing up. Okay. So who can tell me in what year Malaysia stopped being a net sink for carbon? When did we cross this margin and actually become a net source? In other words, when did our emissions finally become greater than the amount of carbon dioxide we remove, our forests remove from the atmosphere? Okay, some of you might know that question. <laughs> the answer to the question, okay, Anthony's looking at me. The answer is 2004. 
Exactly, not that long ago. All right, not that long ago, we were a net sink. We absorbed more carbon from the atmosphere than we emitted. And what has driven this change is investment. Investments in the kinds of, of development that involve fossil fuels is what has brought us to this position. And, and that's one of the reasons, at least, why I believe that investments in different things can move us back in the opposite direction. And that's why I'm focusing on business, because business, regulators, central banks, you wanted good news, our central bank as a regulator is one of the most progressive central banks in requiring that banks begin to implement regulations surrounding the provision and approval of loans. Right? So banks are now required by the central bank to test loans, loan applications, to assess them for their level of climate friendliness. It's called the climate change principles based taxonomy. And taxonomy is simply a way of classifying things, right? So let's classify your loan application, see how it, so, and, and thereby, you know, uh, approve or not approve it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that prompts me to ask a question. Malaysia seems to be more progressive in that way and um, responsible. What about other developed countries like US, UK and so on? Are they also progressively? are responsible in reversing climate change? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> this is moving, so, this is so, moving to international. So, so what I mean is mm. that we are small, but we are playing a very prominent role. But we are just a small emission you know, of carbon, maybe the outside, but yeah. other bigger developed countries are doing much more detrimental <laughs> damages to the environment. Yeah. I'm very glad you, you brought that up because uh, it's, it's one of the things that you sometimes hear being said about Malaysia, that Malaysia's quote unquote contribution to global emissions is very, very small. It's less than 1%. Yeah. And so you will hear that. But what you really need to think about is how much we emit per capita, per person. All right. And in fact, we already emit far in excess of the global average emissions. And we know that the global average emissions actually has to drop for us to survive climate change. So, uh, you know, I, I, uh, uh, while, while uh, uh, Malaysia uh, might not be the best or the worst, it does not absolve any one of us from, from understanding where we need to be in terms Thank of you. emissions reductions. Yeah, we need to think about it from, from a per capita basis yeah. and then mm. ask ourselves if, if a country as gifted as Malaysia with mm. warmth, with sunshine, with rainwater can actually have a per capita consumption that is actually far less than a country that maybe only has deserts or only has snow fields mm. or sunshine only half the year. So, you know, uh, we, we, you know, to, to each based on, on what he has, what do they have, I think they can actually take a leading role and Malaysia believe, I believe can be together with the entire equatorial belt, uh, leaders in, in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's very enlightening. Um, yeah, I like to come back to something that is more deeper and inner, um, that relates to our climate change action. So we know there is some deeper aspects that we have not uncovered or not um, taken into consideration. So climate change, as we can see, is quite often uh, seen as an external problem. Of course, some of you have just now, the uh, MC and also that industry have touched on it. But it for me and also many others, it seems deeply connected to human behaviors and to our mindsets, our attitudes. So how can an individual and collective inner transformation play a role in tackling this climate change? Didi Pratiba? Yeah. 
what we are sorting out with governments and NGOs and stakeholders and uh, you know organizations and all that is a very very slow process let us speed up we have to planet earth mother earth needs us it sustained us for all this time now we need to in return do something about it and so um as I did, I just mentioned about how greed has taken over us, and of course, a lot of other attitudes. If we can only transform that attitude, then also we can help Mother Earth to be healed. And whatever little you can, of course, we'll definitely do it. But thought power is very effective. Anything, any action starts from the thought. And so it is said, thoughts creates attitude. And attitude creates language. And language creates action. And action creates lifestyle. And so whatever other things we're talking about, is like trimming the leaves, trimming the branches. Can we go into the root cause, where it's starting from? And that's where spirituality helps us. Again, please, it is not religion. It is not me and you. It's us. And so planet Earth, the elements which we talked about, we are part of that of our human bodies are made out of it. Water and earth and air and ether and uh, fire. And so let us help this elements. For that, you don't have to literally go into the water and live there or go up on the mountains and spend your time there, renouncing your daily duties or stay in the sky, nothing like that. But every day, if we can create some pure, positive thoughts towards that environment, which I have been doing for many years, and that would then become the environment. Through our pure, positive thoughts, I can purify things around me because pollution is not only outward, it starts from the mind. Many years back, the Brahma Kumaris did a campaign on think clean and think green. And so just think, why are we cutting off the trees? Why? You know, or why are we fishing? Or something like that. And uh, I don't know whether you have watched the movie Avatar. The producer, he's a French, and he was in Mount Abu with us for a peace of mind retreat. And because he doesn't speak Hindi, I took him to meet our administrative head. She was 104. And um, uh, when we went there, he presented his CD in those days, it was CDs, to Dadi. And that he says, I've never watched a movie in my life. Why are you giving me this? He says, please bless my movie so I can bring a message across into the world how we can save our animal world or our vegetation or our elements. That's what the whole movie is about. A war between human beings, animals and forest. Maybe you might not understand, you would just see it as a movie, you know, but it has a very deep message. So spirituality offers values, qualities, and very soon we're going to sit in a little bit of relaxation and give light to these elements. If you even dedicate five minutes of your day towards giving light to our environment, 
that light will reach someone like you talked about, you know, this light towards the dark tunnel. So that light will reach to maybe the governments or maybe environmentalists or maybe the business world, and they would contribute towards saving this planet Earth. So it's not always talking or going and discussing. Sometimes it's also sending these positive thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Didi Pratiba. Now, this looks like maybe little press a little bit further so that I can ask one more question. Is it all right? With our MC and the organizers. Uh, yeah, I think we have a lot to cover. Uh, is it all right if I ask each of them one more question? Is it okay? Nobody is here to answer. So I go ahead, okay, since no one is answering. Oh, they have questions. Yes, yeah, sure. We have a QA. Yeah, good. Then maybe we we open the floor to questions. I think that would be good. Yeah. Come. Uh please help them with the mic. Yeah. Please take the mic. Come over, yeah. Uh don't mind just introduce yourself and then the question and who would you like to address the question to? Om Shanti. I believe what uh, Sister has said is very effective. But I think there's something, one more thing that we have missed. In fact, missed the elephant over the horizon. Animal farming is the second greatest polluter on this earth. I won't quote you statistics, but I'll just give you one very uh, easy statistic. If everyone were to have a green meal once a week, each individual would save 170 kilograms of carbon dioxide. Uh, I notice over the media, they talk about environment issues, they talk about obesity, but no one wants to touch on a very sensitive topic of adopting a plant-based diet. Uh, perhaps uh, some solution can come out of this. By the way, my name is Pishu. I'm from the Malaysian Vegetarian Society. Thank you very much. And you are... <laughs> and you, and, uh, so what's your name, please? You don't mind just to share. Pishu, brother Pishu. Okay. Yeah, I think I think our sister can answer very well because we are all vegetarian. Just, just because of time, I was a little bit conscious, but actually in our UNIA conferences, there are many spiritual organizations who are very strict vegetarians, including the Brahma Kumaris. And so what they do is they don't just want to talk about it, but lunchtime, free. They will make beautiful soya burgers with a lot of salad. And whoever is walking, they would like to give them that as just a complement of vegetarian diet, you know, di uh, lunch. And everybody loves it. The comment is, if this is vegetarian, I'll become vegetarian forever. <laughs> and so, yes, I agree with Brother Pishu very much because Food affects you in your mind. What you eat, where you eat, how you eat, affects a lot. And so if I want to create positive thoughts, then of course, that is also one of the contributions to my thinking pattern. Thank you. Good evening and namaste. Uh, my name is uh, Jay Satya. I'm uh, an architect from Chennai and residing also in Malaysia. So we see a lot about green buildings, green structures and things like that. We are trying our best, but we have a long way to go. But my question here is, um, he was talking about one good thing about governments taking up the initiatives now and things like that. 
But I read recently in a group, somebody brought it up about this Pulau Tioman. They're going to come up with an airport on the, I don't know how many of you know about that, but uh, they're going to build an airport on the seaside, the shore, and they're taking up many few kilometers of the, that, that uh, shore area for the airport. I don't understand how the government, which is so sensitive, supposed to be sensitive to the uh, global um, changes, uh, don't they have somebody to advise them on that? Or is it because each uh, um, sector is act acting individually or they don't have this unison or something where they interact with each other and find out whether it's really going to work or not? And people are also voicing out against it. Why is it not having an effect? I think they're going on a signature campaign or something now, uh, which I would definitely sign to because I, I wouldn't want the nature's you know visibility, vision also. We, when we see nature also it's a, it's a healing thing to us you know it's not just the the you know enjoying it visually also it's something we cannot lose out on that's one thing uh, and another one is we talk about um, other pollutions like what we pollute the environment with but nobody talks about the sound pollution the electromagnetic pollutions the birds that are migrating uh, at a very high uh, altitude uh, they found out that they have these burn marks in their skin because of the electromagnetic radiation that is so high in that level. And we talk about TikTok and all those things which we create awareness, but unfortunately the same media which we use to create awareness is also causing a lot of uh, uh, electromagnetic garbage in the environment. So I think that should also be addressed. And I would like both your views on that. Thank you so much. Yeah, Dr. Gary. Yes, thank, thank you very much. So once again, uh, just a, uh, another quiz. Uh, most of the soybeans produced in the world, what is it for? Livestock. Livestock, absolutely right. So once again, if, if we are thinking about going to a plant-based diet, we have to do it correctly also. Uh, most of the corn grown in the world, incidentally, is actually for fuel, not even for livestock. So the demand for all these things really needs to be reconsidered. Now, it doesn't mean that, okay, when, when did fossil fuels uh, actually begin to be used extensively? Actually, fairly recently. Uh, only, only in the, the, the 1900s, it really took off. Prior to that, we had coal. Yes, coal goes back a ways. But before that, we actually used things like whale oil, right? Not much better, right? But I think that the idea really is, is that are there renewable, are there more environmentally responsible sources of energy that we can actually use. Ones that actually do not destroy the quote unquote factories that, that build them. And that's why uh, when people talk about biomass as being very homogeneous, uh, I say, no, wait a minute, you have to discern. There is biomass that comes from cutting things down and destroying the factory. And then there's biomass that comes as a consequence of harvesting something from a tree that's going to be there for 25, 30, 40 years, etc. So we need to think about, about some refinements, some nuances in the kinds of things we use. So development is a, is a difficult thing in a country where you have different layers of government and state governments have jurisdiction over some issues like land and land use, for example, and the federal government that's trying to work with all these federated states have other uh, jurisdictions. In this case, this is a very difficult situation to deal with. Uh, advocates, uh, advisors can go to the state governments, but states are always hungry for revenue. So a lot of, a lot of uh, the discussion actually uh, is to how to think innovatively about returning more of the control over resources and resource use to the states so that they can actually begin to make responsible decisions about how they manage. Because the state has to understand, yes, I could build this airport and it might bring more people in, but what is the actual um, long-term impact of having more temporary visitors to the state? In other words, you're going to need more fresh water. You're going to need more hotels. You're going to need more bed linens. You're going to need uh, more waste management. You're going to need to bring in more food. So all of these things 
oftentimes are not things that that uh, the uh, economists, that the advisors, that the civil servants at the state level may understand. And you may be uh, killing the goose that is laying the golden eggs, right? So you have an environmentally attractive island of, of a state that is impoverished, perhaps what can you do to bring in quality visitors who are willing to pay more for an island that has a low carbon footprint, that practices ecotourism, where even the boat that's going to take them over to the island is going to be guaranteed uh, uh, fueled by B10, B20, B30, you know, so, so, that, so that it's going to reduce the impact on the environment, or even an electric boat, ultimately, uh, perhaps. So that, that was one. The second question was actually in relation to... Oh, yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm surprised that you stopped that sound because one of, the, the, one of my uh, things is light um, uh, and, and, and they're all linked, right? So what is the purpose of having these very, very uh, intensely bright uh, billboards that are, that are energy uh, you know, um, intensive going running the whole night from dusk till dawn, right? Uh, we should have a regular, I mean, we, we, we wonder why kids don't get interested in astronomy. They can't see the stars because we have so much light pollution, all right? Uh, uh, they, they disorient insects. You find, you know, hundreds of dead moths and things like that. All these things are pollinators for our night flowering plants. And durian is one of them, <laughs> okay? So yes, uh, I, I would very much support an idea. Shut these things down from 2 a.m. To, to 5 a.m., put them on half brightness from 8 p.m. or 7 p.m., 8 p.m. onwards, whatever it is, you know, so that, that it, they're dazzling, they're hazardous even to, to, to drivers. So that it's, it's not just uh, EM radiation, it's not just, uh, we need to understand these things more uh, as well, but uh, clearly uh, sound and, and noise and light are, are, are part of this. Uh, and uh, we should really be thinking about other things as, as well. Um, to, um, it, it, there, there's even this, <laughs> think of this also, information, right? Uh, if you think about information as something like a, a resource that you're bombarded with, that you're surrounded with, there's some things that I think I could really do without <laughs> also. We should have that, that option, yeah? <coughs> I also don't understand human minds sometimes because I've been living in Kenya for 44 years and you know that Kenya homes one of the largest national parks in the world, Masai Mara, and nature has given us a lot. They are trying to save that place, but in spite of that, there is so much of killing of animals and wildlife. They kill because they were told that a rhino horn is very expensive, medicinal, and they, it can bring a lot of dollars to you. So they kill. They kill elephants and all that. And then you know what they're doing on the roundabouts? They're making elephants with metal and lions with metal. I don't understand the human mind. It's a polluted mind, I would say, or a greedy mind. And so we need to go into the root cause. Why is human beings thinking this way? When nature has given us alive animals, we kill them and then we put statues around. What is that? I still don't understand. I'm sorry. I mean, a spiritual person, if I was political, I would go to, to that level. But anyway, I know that spirituality is going to help us to go deep down in the root cause and transform people, people's attitude. Yes, yes. And you know, the other thing you were just mentioning about soya beans and corn, um, we are farming that. For who? animals that's what i was i was told yeah but then we want to eat that animal can't we not eat directly <laughs> so it's like you know it could be more nutrient. it's a vicious cycle but anyway i know everybody is not vegetarian 
but just a thought. In, in Malaysia, we do the same thing with trees. We have metal trees with metal leaves to, yeah, to, yeah, to, to decorate our, our infrastructure. And it, it's, it's puzzled me to no end why uh, some lo local municipalities uh, do that. These things should, should actually be. And then when they do choose species, they, they would choose foreign species, exotic invasives. They, they choose things that are not edible. I mean, we grew up in a situation where we had fruit trees all around us. And some of these trees flowered, uh, fruited year round. Some are achiku trees that fruited year round in my neighborhood. I had, uh, of course, seasonal rambutan trees, mangosteen trees, durian trees. And, and what we plant instead in places that are inaccessible, so that they would actually be quite safe, are actually foreign, uh, you know, species that, that actually have have no place at all here. They might actually be even invasive. So, sorry, Anthony, I didn't mean to take your time. Um, okay, my name is Anthony Tan. The organization I'm from is quite long, so I'm going to take a deep breath. The All-Party Parliamentary Group Malaysia on Sustainable Development Goals. The acronym is also very long, APBGM SDG. Um, to... Two things that I, I would like to bring up here. One is a, a sharing. We work with parliamentarians from both sides of the political divide. And each time I meet a parliamentarian, uh, one of the questions I ask them is this. Is it fair that the Climate Change Act will come to you this thick? You have three days to read it. And then you will make a decision that will affect me, my children, and grandchildren for the next 30 years. No, Anthony, it's not fair. Then why don't you make a change? Why don't you have parliamentary committees to actually review this? Why don't you actually call up the minister and the ministry officials to explain you what is in the act? So that's the first thing. The second thing that I'd like to bring up, and this I think I brought up with Gary, and I'm, I'm quite sure sister here would know. We have this thing called climate diplomacy. Now, and it comes off with climate negotiations. If you're on the Titanic and you know it's going to sink, why play a game of cards and say, hooray, I won? You're going to die with the rest of the people anyway, isn't it? Correct or not? Yeah? So why is it when it comes to climate diplomacy, climate negotiations, they leave the conscience at the door and go in and lie through their teeth? Thank you. This is where morals comes yeah. in, values come in, and we have to time and again remind human beings, you know, human and being, being is the spiritual identity, human is the physical identity, but unfortunately, we've even lost humanness, I'm sorry. And so if we can even become better humans, you know, that is more than enough. And then I can become a being that is a spiritual identity, which has all the positive qualities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anthony. I always uh, uh, enjoy listening to you. Yes, we do have climate diplomacy. We also have something called climate justice. Yes, we also uh, have the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. We know that the population, that we know that there are populations uh, living on this planet uh, who have had minimal, if at anything, any responsibility at all for the historical emission of greenhouse gases. And by coincidence, many of these same populations are the ones who are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. One of the, the bright spots that came out of the Glasgow COP, no, actually, no, it was, it was the Nairobi COP, was actually the establishment of a fund for loss and damage for some of the most uh, threatened, some of the most uh, vulnerable countries to climate change. We've called for this fund for years and years and years. And finally, some of the developed countries agreed to establish to the establishment of the fund and they put some money in 
But there's a caveat there. There is no admission whatsoever in any way, shape or form of responsibility or liability for having caused this in the first place, all right? So once again, it's, it is like pulling teeth and yes, climate diplomacy exists, but we have to make sure it exists with climate justice. You have to make sure that it exists with things like a just transition because even as we want to change the way we live, we have to take into account that there are people whose only way of life might hinge on something that depends solely on fossil fuels. And we need to help them to bridge this as well. It's no use trading one slave driver master for another. We need to actually make real change. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oh, okay. When we talk about human attitude, Nairobi has a huge forest, which was naturally the Karura forest, but greedy leaders wanted to develop and make high rise buildings, concrete jungle, cut off the forest. But um, Green Belt Movement, one of my friends, Wangari Mathai, was very active. Can you imagine this leader sent people to beat her up? Yeah. But anyway, she did have moral support from all of us. She is late now, of course. She's worked a lot, but at least she saved two places in the country. One is Karura Forest, and the other, other one is uh, Uhuru Highway, but Uhuru Park. But unfortunately, in Uhuru Park, they make huge monuments with uh, marble and cement. I don't know why you need this monuments. So we are very conscious about it. But now we are working with her daughter. She's equally very active. And so sometimes we join hands together and work together. So we're not only, you know, uh, addressing one side, but all around. And as I mentioned, we will definitely have success. Thank you, thank you very much. Do we have any more questions? I think we, we have got, okay, one last question, and then we'll come to the close. Oh, you have got one. Okay, come then. Okay. Carbon tax. <laughs> That's a very Thank you very much. Check, check. Okay. That, that's a very good question, very straightforward question, very short question. When is Malaysia going to have a carbon tax? Uh, truthful answer, I do not know. Um, in fact, I do not know if they will have a tax or they will have an emissions trading scheme. Uh, all of these things are being uh, discussed as we sit here right now. Really, they are. And uh, these are decisions that shouldn't be taken lightly. I'm, I'm glad they're not being taken lightly. But I'm, I'm also glad that they are in a pipeline to be taken and that our current administration knows that that time is of the essence. I think that's the most important thing. So it's, it's, it's vitally important. I know when our uh, policy makers, decision makers, parliamentarians slip up, we are very vocal. But when they do the right thing, we are normally as Asians, many Asians are all too silent. We need to actually send them a strong message when they do the right thing and stand up and say, yes, that was the correct thing to do. We hope to see more of it. And I think that's one area where as Malaysians, we are pretty much asleep. So we, we, we can do much, much better when they move in the right direction. Great, thank you. Yeah, good evening. My name is Naidu Loknat. So I have a, a question that, yeah, we have talked so much of higher uh, points. So what is the basic three or four points which we should do ourselves, which is the basic and we should implement it? Yeah, as sister explained, the first is I think is the thoughts which uh, changes uh, the attitude of the people and greediness. So what other three things, which is the basic so that the <laughs> great question, the, yeah. become a vegetarian once a week. <laughs> yeah. Try that. Yeah, because you'll contribute a lot. And then, of course, uh, when I talk about pure thoughts, 
It's also part of our system meditation, because when I become calm and positive, I can help out there. So it's like, you know, inward to outward. What we are doing is outward to inward. What is the outward environment going to contribute to me? Anger and jealousy and competition and all that. And I am taking all that within me. And um, I'll tell you, you know, UNEP, last 40 years I've been going there. They don't acknowledge me because they think you're religious and you're spiritual and all that. And now that they've started this body, uh, Faith for Earth, we started with four organization, uh, Holy See, which is again political, uh, Brahma Kumaris, Baha'is, and the African traditional religion and the Islam. And now we are more than 700 organizations on that body, and they're very active. And so, it is contributing. In last Junia, unfortunately, we had Ethiopian air crash. And so every time a session started, some of our members died, some UN staff died, some guests died. And so every time they started a session, they wanted a moment of silence. And that was very effective because it makes the crown rather than just barge into discussion and talking. And as you say, what? Let us contribute a little bit of silence to this environment because silence brings a lot of strength and power to do what we want, decision making in many other things. And so, you know, these are the little day to day contributions for a better environment. Thank yeah. you, sister. Thank you. Uh, um, according to my view, uh, I just wanted to add up some here is that uh, as a, for the government, they should put some policy for the trees not to cut. And as an individual, we should encourage our younger generations to plant some trees. And as an individual, we should uh, reduce the plastic wastage. That's what I Thank can, you very much. Can I add? You have something? I'd like yeah. to add something as well. Uh, one, more, one minute. Kenya has a very strict law of plastic. You can't use plastic in that country or travel with. Can you imagine in the beginning when the law was you know, introduced, they were fining us a huge fine if they see plastic in your bag? Corrupt. The officers are corrupt. The police is corrupt. I'm sorry. So if you caught with plastic and you say, I'll give you $100, fine. So where's the law gone? So go back down into the morals. It's very important. One time I was sharing a stage with anti-corruption and they were giving huge, you know, t-shirts with written anti-corruption. And what was happening there? They were all giving one another two t-shirts and three t-shirts. <laughs> Again, corruption there only. So I actually did voice out. I did voice out, you know, that this is not the solution to just give a T-shirt and walk around. Can we work on ourselves? So that's where the root cause is. Thank you, yeah. sister. Can, can I just add one more point regarding his, um, the Loknas question? Um, in the Brahma Kumaris, we have... Um, UN policy, Brahma Kumari's environmental policy, I would like to add that separately, um, that we individuals are guardians of Earth's resources. And with respect to that, but I've got four points like what you say. Uh, what I put in short is L bulls. Living simplicity, living simply, living in simplicity and be buying compassionately be you and l is um using economically and learning continuously and sharing generously i think each of us if we can can adopt this and i think we could then really help not only in reversing the climate change but also enriching our lives i repeat again living in simplicity buying compassionately using economically learning continuously sharing generously 
So if we do that, I think we can then bring home <laughs> the fact. Okay. Thank you, sister. Thank, thank, thank you very you. much. I think that, that just by thinking, you already will accomplish a lot. We talked about, about self-awareness, but I think that we also need self-consciousness. Uh, you know, just understanding where your water comes from, where your food comes from, uh, where even your clothes, your shoes, where all the, these things come from, uh, and thinking consciously before every turn of a tap, every, um, <laughs> I, have to, I have to tell my son this, taps have gone from being actually very user unfriendly, where you had to actually turn it and it was small for a while, and you just turn it more and it gets bigger and it gets bigger and, it's, and then it's finally, now it's binary, on, off, on, off, and all is full. So I tell my son, just because it's on off doesn't mean you have to turn it all the way. You can turn it this much or this much or this much. You can choose. And that comes from actually thinking first. If you do that before everything you do, uh, you will make it. And, and the second thing really is I don't have three things. I only have to tell. You really have to tell people. I'm, sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm really sorry. I have to tell you that, that I was speaking when this was happening. I didn't realize it. Otherwise, I would have said, I have a tumbler in my bag. Please don't open this. Give it to somebody who doesn't have a tumbler and doesn't have that water with them, who needs it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So <laughs> tell. Don't, don't be. And tell your decision makers. Tell your politicians, uh, not only when they're doing right, but even more important, tell them when they're doing the right thing. That, that's the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we have come to the end of time. We can sit here the whole night, isn't it? And continue to have this very beautiful conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much to our esteemed panelists. I think it has been a very enlightening, very interesting, and very enriching conversation. So um, we have got so many other items more. Thank you, Sister Celia. Thank you, Sister Celia and panelists. So we heard so much from the horse's mouth, straight from the horse's mouth. So the question now is, what am I going to do next? When I'm going to begin? Whatever that I've planned to do. So thoughts, it all begins with thoughts. That's what Dr. Gary Tassira said. So we're going to spend some time now just to sit back and relax and reflect on whatever that was shared just now. And also, we're going to listen to a commentary by Didi Pratiba during this reflection. Let us all sit up straight. Just relax. Letting go the sound around you is just fading. And with our mind and intellect, let us step inward. Look for required space within yourself and just be there. Listen to the silence within yourself. It's so soothing, so calm.
and feel so light. I am not this body of chemicals and particles, flesh and blood, but I'm a spiritual being working through this body. This body is my instrument. The more pure elements, the healthier the body. And so I am sending light to these elements on planet Earth through this body. The spine is the Earth. The whole body stands with the support of the spine. We all are part of that planet Earth and that's our home. The throat is the ether, the sky. It's like the sounds travel in a form of waves from one place to the other. And my throat works as sending the sound out there. My heart is the element of air. It's pumping in and out. And then I go to the navel. Above the navel is fire, the element of fire, which helps me to transform. And below the navel is water. And so all the five elements on this planet Earth is nature. I want to purify and support and save. Let me give that positive light through my peaceful nature. I am a peaceful being, a pure being a loving and caring being and I give this energy and light to the elements and all five elements gets purified, saved and the bodies which are consisting of these elements will give us a very healthy body. Let us share this light with the body and the elements and we will transform this planet Earth and the world. Thank you. Thank you, Didi.
We have now come to the climax of the event today. Something very significant, very meaningful, and we're going to do it together. We're going to do it from within our hearts. It is a pledge of collective consciousness. And to carry this out, I invite Sister Celia, accompanied by some of our guests who are here with us today. So we begin with, uh, so when I call your names, um, please come up to the stage. Datin Sri Sunita Rajkumar. Dr. Gary Tessera, just remain seated. Brother Pio. I think we should remove, no. Should we remove this? And our supporting partners, Mr. Navaganesh Bhatmanathan. I think we should remove. Representing should. Professor Dr. Joy, Chairman of Malaysia Network for Research on Climate, Environment and Development. Southeast Asia Disaster Prevention Research Initiative, an Asian network on climate science and technology. Ms. Lavanya Rama, Head of Climate Change and Policy. Ms. Aida Hayati, Senior Program Officer, Global Environment Center. Mr. Raj Kumar, President of Malaysian Vegetarian Society. Brother Peru, please. Mr. Faisal Mansour, country led Pro Veg Malaysia. Mr. Anthony Tan, Director of Finance, All Party Parliamentary Group Malaysia. Sustainable Development Goals Secretariat. Mr. Charles Tan, Chairman of Center for Environment, Technology and Development. Mr. Pui Li Yun, Representative, Bukit Bandaraya Residents Association. <clears throat> Professor Sager, President. Malaysia Yoga Wellness Association. Ms. Siti Nur Fahira Binti Muhammad, PhD student in Environmental Health, University Putra, Malaysia. Mr. Magad Azman Magad, lecturer of University Technology Mara. Ms. Hamiza Shamsuddin, campaigner, Greenpeace, Malaysia. Mr. Muhammad Redwan, Professional Technologist, Green Tech, DSH Institute of Technology. Master Mani Segeran, Founder and President, Harmony on Earth. Ms. Yi Wei Xie, Environmental Analyst, Ericon Lestari Sundarian Berhad. Mr. Yao Sheng Yin, Malaysia South Youth Council, sorry, and Young Buddhist Association of Malaysia. He represents Malaysia Youth Council. Mr. Muhammad Shahani bin Abdullah, Honorary Secretary of Malaysia Environmental NGOs. Mr. Jaffrey bin Abdullah, Representative, Sustainable Development Network. Malaysia. Ms. Christina Fu, Corporate Director of Priority One. Ms. Noor Azlinda Ismail, rep representing Department of Environment. And Mr. Sandeep, Yoga Master. Sister Celia, the time Thank is yours. You. Thank you very much. So we're going to do something that's very significant and of utmost importance for this whole event. And so we will together, I'll just share the context a little bit first. 
we will together make a collective consciousness pledge to shift the whole climate dimension. We believe that by working on our own consciousness and raising our awareness, we can contribute positively to the collective consciousness and thereby influencing thereby influencing the world at large. So when we work on our own consciousness and raising our awareness, together collectively we can influence and the whole world. So dear brothers and sisters, as this is an important event tonight, an integral part of this event, I would like to invite, besides all of us, that each and every one of you, may I invite all of you to stand up, please? And also, to place your hand over your heart. And now, let us turn our mind inwards. What does it mean by that? We turn our mind, switch off from everything that is external to a place of peace and silence. And in that state of peace and silence, I, the inner being, I, the inner being, the consciousness, the divine life force, I connect with the highest consciousness, the supreme light, the supreme soul, supreme being. And together, in that state of sweet, Silence, in that state of silent, conscious remembrance, I envision a pure, a clean, a perfect state of the world, of the earth, that beautiful world that is filled with joy, peace, and harmony. And now, may I ask you to hold this beautiful world silently in your mind, in your heart. Have this beautiful feeling that definitely this golden world this pure, clean, perfect state will come about not too distant future. Now holding this vision, I vibrate the clean, pure energy within my whole being I vibrate the clean, pure energy within my whole being. Every bodily cell, to every bodily cell, every organ in my body, every nerves filled with this clean and pure, perfect energy. And then to the entire outer ecology, from me to my inner body, to the outer ecology, the entire world, 
And I continue to serve daily, daily in this way, to shift the whole climate from metaphysical dimension to its original, to the clean and cool and perfect state. I envision this. I feel it in my heart. And I allow this pure, clean energy to radiate out to the whole world. And I'm sure, I strongly believe that this clean, perfect state will come soon, very soon. So thank you very much. Thank you. May we take our seat. Thank you. Please remain on stage, our uh, guests. Please remain on stage. All right. Sorry, I can't hear you. So we take this opportunity to honor our guests who said yes the moment we extended our invitation for this program and also those who cooperated in various ways. So um, I call upon Brother Pure to present token of appreciation to, first of all, Datin Sri Sunita Rajkumar, our guest of honor for today. Okay, uh, that is three. You, you may come down and be seated. <laughs> so sorry. Thank you. Thank you for cooperating. Dr. Gary Tessera. Thank you, Dr. Gary. Then we have um, Mr. Navaganesh Padmanathan. Ms. Lavanya Rama. Ms. Lavanya Rama, is she here today? Ms. Aida Hayati. Mr. Raj Kumar. And now I invite Brother Peru to present the tokens to Mr. Faisal Mansour. Mr. Anthony Tan. Mr. Charles Tan. Mr. Pui Li Yun. Professor Sager, President, Malaysia Yoga Wellness Association. Ms. Siti Nur Fahira Binti Muhammad. Mr. Magad Azman Magad. Now I call upon DD Pratiba to hand over the token of appreciation to Mr. Muhammad Redwan. Ms. Hamiza Shamsuddin. Master Mani Segeran. Ms. Yi Wei Xie, Mr. Yao Xiang Yen,
Mr. Muhammad Shani bin Abdullah. Mr. Jaffrey bin Abdullah. Ms. Christina Fu. Ms. Nur Azlinda Ismail. And Mr. Sandeep. Thank you, Didi, and thank you to all our specially invited guests for being with us today. Now is going to be uh, another special moment, very significant for the Brahma Kumaris. So whenever we have a program, we always end it with a presentation of sweet and words of inspiration, um, so, which is uh, very meaningful. So once you receive these words, these cards, when you read it, you'll find it is so meaningful. So uh, we are going to spend um, some time just to receive the sweets and the words of inspiration. And then, please do not leave yet, because we are going to go for a vegetarian dinner. <laughs> yes. So uh, please be around, and uh, we will begin. So we will begin with. Uh, yeah. So we'll begin with um, uh, Datin Sri. She's not here. Datin Sri. Okay, and uh, Dr. Gary Tassera. Who's going to be seated on the stage? Didi Pratiba? And Brother Pio? So once you receive the sweet and the uh, the card, so please remain seated. Come, go back to your seats because we're going to have a group photo. So that is uh, something for us. So uh, as as part of our memory of this program. So then we will go for dinner. Okay. So thank you, thank you for all the patience. So we begin with um, actually Dr. Dr. Tassera, supposed to be presenting your receiving your gifts and Toli and your blessing. I will be coming out. It's not photo taking session yet. So. <laughs> yeah, so sorry, Dr. Gary. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe you want to usher him, sister, to, to receive the toli and the blessing. I ask myself, what can I do? The world seems sad, the dreams we had are through. The words I could say won't help them now, cause words won't make the sadness go away. And uh, we will follow with our brother, uh, Mr. Nava Ganesh. Mr. Nava Ganesh, please. So shall we just go row by row? Yeah, okay. So uh, this row, please, just go and receive your sweet and your um, words of inspiration. So the next row, please. Yeah, just follow. Happy hearts are the reason to change. 
change our thoughts and gradually we change our world so smile on our world smile on our world it doesn't take too much it seems to make a change to love and peace smile on our world smile on Take too long, it seems, to make a change to love and peace. Smile on our world, smile on our world, smile on each other, your sister and brother. Please remain seated. Go back to your seats, please, for a group photo after this. We'll have our photo taking after this. So we need everyone's cooperation to return to your seats. Just a few more rows, I think. Then we can take our group photo. A few more. Can melt even the hardest heart. It seems that now is the season. Happy hearts are the reason to change our thoughts and gradually we change our world. So smile on our world. Smile on our world. It doesn't take too much, it seems. Make a change to love and peace. Smile on our world. Smile on our world. It doesn't take too long, it seems, to make a change to love and peace. Smile on our world. Smile on our world. Smile on each other, your sister. Okay, now uh, we call upon all everyone to come forward. Please come forward. And yeah. for our group photo. Okay. Brother Yong Chai is here. Yeah, not really. No. Please come forward. Um, yes. Please come forward and then we will 
Some of us will be on the stage, some of us below. Please come. Uh, come, brothers. Yeah, some of us can just sit by the side. Okay, our cameraman is ready now. What can I do? The world seems sad. The dreams we had. Are yeah, one more sister who's jogging towards the front. The words I could say won't help them now. Because words won't make the sadness yeah, this brother. go away. But pure love helps the healing. Good wishes create good feelings. Loving thoughts can melt even the hardest heart. It seems that now is the season. Happy hearts are the reason to change our thoughts, and gradually we change our world. 